The British conquest of India was hardly planned from the start. As Richard Holmes put it in his book Saab, The British Soldier in India, to which I owe the majority of this video, it was an excellent example of the quote, flag following trade, as it was driven by the expansion and preservation of commercial interests above all else. Indeed, while the British government did play an active role in the governance of these territories, until 1858, British India was actually ruled by a corporate entity, the Honorable East India Company. Now, the workings of company rule as a whole were extraordinarily complex and varied massively through the years, so I'll not attempt to explain them in this video. Instead, in this video topic, chosen by my ever generous supporters on Patreon, I shall focus on one of the most significant and iconic factors of the company in India, their army, as indeed in order to defend and actively expand their own interests on the subcontinent, alongside those of the state which held sovereignty over them, the East India Company maintained a fully functional private military force. In this video, we'll discuss the makeup and organization of this company army, as well as how it related to government forces. From the mid-18th century until 1858, there were three types of soldiers in British India. There were government soldiers from regular British Army regiments, often referred to as Her Majesty's Regiments or HM Regiments. Uh, there were British and other white soldiers fighting under company command with company-led regiments, generally called the European Regiments. And there were Indian soldiers, also under company control in native regiments. Now, regardless of their relative experience and fighting strength, they all fell into a strict military and social hierarchy, which, as we shall come to see, dominated the way in which the three types were organized and interacted with each other. But first, a little bit of history regarding the development of the company's forces. In the earliest days of the company's presence in India, her forces amounted to little more than mercenaries and watchmen, what Holmes described as a raggle-taggle of European troops groups alongside locally recruited peons. They were little trained and poorly outfitted, and they served really to protect company assets in the form of trading posts that were referred to in the day as factories. Well, this began to change in 1746 during the First Carnatic War, uh, the Indian theater of the War of the Austrian Succession, when French forces seized Madras from the British after facing really only a pitiful resistance. The response came in the form of Major Stringer Lawrence, who was appointed as the first commander-in-chief in India and took command over all company forces in 1748. A veteran of Culloden, he immediately began drilling the men to European standards and dressed them in a European style. Thanks to his efforts to professionalize the East India Company's army, Stringer is now known as the father of the Indian army. Further reforms were introduced by the third commander-in-chief of uh, India, Robert Clive, in the form of fully native regiments, also outfitted and drilled to European standards and led by British officers. The company's army would grow rapidly over the years, as so too did their land holdings, and go from, in the 1740s, a paltry garrison force to a combined strength of some 18,000 by 1763. And by 1805 and the Napoleonic Wars, it was a staggering total of around 155,000. Of these, 24,000 were British and other European soldiers, and 130,000 were Indian natives. As you can imagine, uh, this trend of expansion continued eagerly through the years as company interests expanded. These men were not all part of a single unified force, though, but were divided among the same administrative lines as the company itself into three presidency armies of Bengal, Madras, and Bombay, each with a distinctive recruiting base in a very diverse landscape. So there we have a very brief overview of the origins of the company's army in India. Now let's go into more detail on their organization and how this private army related to their counterparts in Her Majesty's Army. It is, after all, important to realize that while, yes, until the Sepoy Mutiny in 1857, the majority of non-native soldiers, who 
were in and of themselves always the majority by far. Well, they were company-employed men, not government troops, but still there was always a very strong government presence in India, or at least for most of the time there was. Because you see, from the mid-18th century, well, HM regiments were only irregularly posted to India, but their role in the security and, and expansion of the territory grew rapidly, and by 1840, 29 regiments were posted there, which represented almost a third of all overseas troops, and just under a quarter of the full strength of the regular infantry. And of those 29 regiments, 13 of them had been in India for longer than 15 years. These were long postings. And as might be expected, government troops always took precedence over company troops, at least in the eyes of the state they did. Legally, an officer holding a commission from the sovereign was always considered senior over a man of supposedly equal rank who received his commission from the company. If, for example, you had a freshly recruited captain in the Queen's army join the line of march with a company captain with many years of hard service, well, the new officer would still be taking precedence and thus hold authority over the older, more experienced man. And naturally, there were many disputes over this sort of thing, with various officers on occasion not even recognizing the legal authority of an outsider over them. And these disputes could be made even worse, of course, from the fact that after the 1754 Mutiny Act, company officers were actually given the reciprocal authority to command government troops, although they were still restricted by those rules of seniority. Furthermore, the authority of a company officer over crown forces only applied in India itself, anything west of the Cape of Good Hope, and they were little better than any other gentleman in their authority. Of course, the differences between crown and company officers were hardly restricted to legality and seniority. In practice, company officers were generally far less well off, and many came to rely on bata, an additional monetary allowance provided to soldiers and officers who were on campaign, to sustain themselves and pay off debts, effectively bonuses. There were also generally far fewer promotion opportunities within the company. While in Britain you would expect a battalion, for example, to be commanded by a lieutenant colonel, Company battalions were often commanded by mere captains, and there were very few postings above the rank of major. And to make matters worse, after the rank of lieutenant, all promotion in the company was based on a far stricter system of seniority than in the regular army, making those few officer posts all the more coveted. The average age of a company officer was 49, while the average for a crown officer in India was only 42, and that was likely another source of tension when you consider again that crown officers always held legal seniority. And as a result of this, it was not uncommon for company officers to form subscription clubs, where money would be put together by lower officers to literally bribe higher officers to retire, thus freeing up a spot and allowing all of the men in the subscription system to advance. This was, of course, illegal, as unlike crown officers, company commissions could not be purchased. Early on in its history, the company explicitly hired tradesmen rather than gentlemen, although this policy did loosen in later years. But still, there was always the inescapable social perceptions of who these men were and who they were fighting for. A Queen's officer held a commission directly signed by Her Majesty the Queen. A company officer signed by a board of directors. A Queen's regiment was made up of government soldiers, an official arm of the nation, whereas a company regiment could be well, if not perfectly, described as little more than mercenaries in some ways. This subtle, though highly significant perception may perhaps be best found in the difficult transition which many company men made when they were amalgamated into Her Majesty's Army after the mutiny in 1857. Historian Peter Stanley referred to the widespread outbreaks of indiscipline and disorder, including many men outright leaving the service, as the White Mutiny. And an excellent example quoted in Saab would be a sergeant who, quote, narrowly escaped prosecution for saying, Jack, will you loop up that tent? Rather than, Jones, loop up the tent. 
That said, however, the genuine differences of background between the two kinds were probably less severe than it's often believed. Generally speaking, only about a quarter of Queen's officers were from the nobility or the gentry. Indeed, another way of good example, uh, the company's officer corps actually expanded quite rapidly after the Seven Years' War, when many government regiments were disbanded or reduced, resulting in a good deal of redundant officers seeking new employment. Many company officers had been previously employed by the regular army. And interestingly enough, along similar lines, in 1798, the East India Company actually set up 10 cadet ships at the Royal Military Academy in Woolwich, and later, in 1809, even started their own academy at Addiscombe, uh, with a two-year course modeled after the Royal Military Academy. Despite their differences, the regular and company armies were hardly isolated from each other. As for the enlisted men of the company's European regiments, however, these differences may not have been so bad. As Private Lawrence Halloran wrote in 1849, quote, The company's service is a great deal better out here than the Queen's. Any man of good character can get four or six months' passport, but in a Queen's regiment, they can only get three or four days. Indeed, while Crown regiments were often plagued with recruiting difficulties, company recruiting sergeants, often retired from the regular army, had little difficulty meeting their own quotas. But if the differences between government and company regiments may seem great in areas, the distinctions between British and Indian forces were far more severe. So now let's discuss the third aspect of the company's private military force, the native regiments, or the sepoy regiments. Made up wholly of native Indians at the enlisted level, these men were not merely auxiliary troops or slave soldiers. They were volunteers just like in the regular British army, and they were the most essential tool that the company had at its disposal for the protection and expansion of its interests on the subcontinent. From a modern perspective, it may be rather confusing why so many Indians enlisted willingly in a Western-style army. Now, while that could well be a video project all its own, for now, suffice to say that for many, the reasons would have been, well, fairly similar to why anyone else would enlist. It offered a chance to get away from an old life, it offered better pay than could be expected of an unskilled laborer, and it even offered you a pension at the end of your service if you survived. There was also, of course, a strong mercenary and martial tradition among many Indian populations, particularly in the north of the subcontinent, and the British really used these traditions to their advantage when seeking new recruits. The basic rank for an Indian soldier was that of sepoy, the equivalent of a private in a European regiment. Natives also made up the non-commissioned officers of these regiments, with the rank of Naik, corresponding to Corporal, and Havildar for Sergeant. They even had their own officers to a limited extent, the most junior posting being the uh, Jemadar, and the most senior the Subadar, the equivalent to a captain in the British Army. It is important to keep in mind, however, that even as Subadar, a native officer never had the authority to command European soldiers. As well, native regiments were never completely under native control. Native infantry regiments had two British officers at the head of each of their ten companies, for a total of twenty per regiment. Though this would change after the mutiny in 1857, the numbers remained roughly the same. Native cavalry regiments had about 24 British officers for every 400 men, as each individual troop was also headed by a Briton. Somewhat surprisingly, irregular troops, where soldiers were not faced with the same uh, regulations as regular soldiers, and they supplied their own equipment, only had four British officers, a commandant, a second-in-command, an adjutant, and a surgeon. Another key component to these company-led Indian troops, which is often misunderstood, is exactly how they were outfitted and trained. 
After the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 and the eradication of the company's private army in favor of a full British Raj over India, it became British policy to not only keep a firm ratio of one British soldier for every two Indian, but also to ensure that Indian soldiers were always outfitted with outdated equipment. They also removed the Indian manned artillery units, which had been in existence from the early 19th century, allowing only the smallest of guns to be operated by natives, while the Royal Artillery took possession of all the rest. But before the mutiny, before all of these things were used against the British, things looked very different in the company-controlled army. Firstly, the company's army was far more Indian than when the British government took over. In 1794, company forces had 16,000 European soldiers and 82,000 Indian. By 1805, there were just under 25,000 Europeans alongside 130,000 Indian. When the mutiny struck in 1857, there were about 40,000 European soldiers and over 225,000 Indians. So again, while the British government would later demand one Briton to every two Indians, and indeed in 1906 there were 75,000 British troops to only 158,000 Indian, under company rule there was only one white soldier for every five Indian. And again, it's important to remember that before the mutiny, Indian soldiers were equipped to a much higher standard, including having fully modern native artillery batteries. And while I can't imagine that they would have been uh, quite so well trained and equipped in reality as they were on paper, all the same, this proved a massive difficulty for the British in subduing the revolt in 57, and readily explains the restrictions later introduced. But that said, the company army was far more Indian than we may imagine. And as regards the ability of the sepoys in drill, discipline, and courage in the field, well, naturally it varied massively over the years and across different regions. You'll find in different battles and from the perspectives of different officers accounts of native troopers being praised as the greatest, bravest, and proudest men in the world, in stark contrast to the whinging and frail European soldiers, just as you'll find plenty of accounts of native troops being cowardly, barbarous, and ill-disciplined brutes in contrast to the proud and dignified Europeans. In the end, a great deal depends on precisely where the account is coming from, who had written it, and the context in which it was recorded. To take any one or even dozen examples and attempt to generalize the ability of the company Sepoy across a hundred plus years of history, three different presidency armies, and innumerable conflicts and expeditions would be pure folly, so I'll not attempt to do so here. And now to conclude. The Honorable East India Company was, for better or worse, an utterly remarkable institution. A private company, it ruled over lands more vast and populous than the homeland which bore it, and commanded a military of large enough scale to rival many sovereign states. It was a diverse military, with a small core of British and European soldiers supported by large numbers of natives well-trained and equipped to modern European standards. It was subservient to, and aligned closely with, the British regular army, and yet it maintained its own very distinctive identity. If you're interested in learning more about this army, and particularly the experience of British soldiers in India from the mid-18th century to the start of the 20th, again, I must recommend Richard Holmes' Saab, The British Soldier in India, from which, again, the grand majority of research for this video has been drawn, though I have, of course, only begun to scratch the surface of this extraordinary subject. Again, as well, I would like to thank my supporters on Patreon for having chosen this topic of discussion, and as well thank them for their patience in how long it took me to actually put all of this together. And of course, until the next time, my dear viewer, I have the pleasure to be, and so shall ever remain, your most humble and obedient of servants.